In the Arab world, even going back to the pre-Islamic era, poetry, eloquence and music formed a big part of their society. The Arabs were known for their eloquence and speech and poetry and it was really entrenched in their daily lives and was part of tradition. They appreciated good language skills. This also carried on into the medieval period. So let's have a look at music in the medieval Arab world. Welcome to the Golden Middle Age. As we said earlier, Arabs were very much into their poetry and music. It was one of their strongest points and the poetry that came out of that time is pretty amazing. In fact, the Quranic text itself, which is the holy scripture of the religion of Islam, was revealed and made the massive impact we know about because of its high level of poetry and linguistic techniques, which astonished the Arabs at the time. So poetry and music were intertwined in the Arab world and you couldn't have a good poem without a musical rhythm which suited it. It would go hand in hand and if you were a good poet with good musical melodies, you gained much respect. This is how influential music and poetry was in the Arab world from the pre-Islamic era up until the Middle Ages. There are many historical records, for example, Kitab al aghan which was written in about the 10th century. And this book depicted a number of musicians and to mention a few names, for example, um, Tawais and Ibn Mijah. When Islam spread to Arabia, Persia, Turkey and India, they were actually regions known to have possessed music traditions, which meant that their musical tradition was brought into the Arab world. The Arabs also translated a number of Greek musical treaties, which was modified and adapted to Islam's rules. Specifically, it was under the Abbasid rule that music gained greater respect due to the famous works of, for example, Ishaq al-Mawsili, revived Arabian music tradition. What's also interesting is that music was considered as a branch of philosophy and mathematics. As you know, in our previous videos, we mentioned many famous scientists that emerged from the Islamic Golden Age. One of them was Al-Kindi. Al-Kindi delved into the theory of music. And you'd be surprised, I mean, I certainly was, because when you think of these names, what comes to your mind straight away is maths and science, for example, or astronomy. But on the contrary, they were also experts in music. For example, Al-Kindi suggested a detailed fretting for the Oud instrument. As you know, the Oud is a famous instrument when it comes to Arabic music. And one of the most important treaties was called the Book of Sounding Strings Instruments of One String to Ten String. And this treatise dealt with the eight rhythmic modes used in Al-Kindi's time. And he also talked about the cosmological connotations of music. Al-Kindi was also the first to realize the therapeutic value of music and he attempted to cure some people with certain disorders with musical therapy. Al-Farabi is also a renowned name. Some historians say that when Al-Farabi played his Oud, he would make his audience either laugh or cry or even fall asleep depending on the mood of his tune. And the same sources say that he was the inventor of the two well-known instruments, the Rabbab and the Qanun. Someone I would also like to mention is Ibn Sina and his most notable works were Al-Shifa Al-An-Najat which we mentioned in one of our previous videos I think on medieval soap or the top 10 Muslim scientists in the Middle Ages. So these works contained lengthy chapters on music which provided detailed descriptions of instruments which were used back then and we will talk about them later on in the video. But music in the medieval Arab world took a very mystical approach which is known as Sufism. The Sufis took music to, into a new dimension and music became as a means of contemplation, helping the body and soul in the remembrance and worship of Allah or God. This view was propagated and developed by Al-Ghazali, a famous medieval scholar. He argued that the power of music will help increase the religious feeling and you will be able to have a very mystical experience. Jalaluddin al-Rumi, another famous name in the medieval a Sufi world further built on Al-Ghazali's thoughts and works. These are known as Mada'ih, which praise God and his holy prophet Muhammad. And it's actually still practiced up until today. So you can see there are many different aspects of music in the medieval Arab world, from religious uh, to scholars taking Greek theories 
and uh, musical traditions and adapting them to suit the Arab and Islamic world. The instruments used in the medieval Arab world also influenced medieval Western Europe. As we all know, the oud or the lute in English is one of the first instruments that comes to mind when we think of traditional Arab music. The oud was such a popular instrument and it was so popular that poets wrote actual poems about the oud. <laughs> For example, uh, there's a poem which was recited by a man called Sa'id al-Din al-Halli and he goes on to say, um, but I actually had to write this down because I couldn't learn it off by heart. It was uh, a bit too tricky for me. The Arabic was very old and you know classical. So he says, وَعُودٍ بِهِ عَادَ السُرُورُ لِأَنَّهُ حَوَى اللَّهُ قِدْمًا وَهُوَ رَيَّانٌ نَاعِمٌ يُغَرَّبُ فِي تَغْرِيدِهِ فَكَأَنَّهُ يَعِيدُ لَنَا مَا لَقَّنَتْهُ الْحَمَائِمُ um, I hope you read the uh, translation at the bottom. So we can see that there was this deep connection with the Oud and it's illustrated in poems like these. It's as if the Oud was an escape route from the hectic life and the fact that it was implemented in religious practice, especially with Sufism, it seems like the Oud elevated a medieval Arab person to new spiritual heights. So how influential was music and the Arab instruments in the medieval world? Well, what I can tell you is that it was influential enough to reach Europe. In fact, many of the instruments the Europeans used from the medieval times up until today originate from the Arab world. Let's look at a few examples. Instruments like the lute is derived from the Arabic word al oud You also have the rabab, which is the rebek, and this was a famous medieval instrument. And the last example I would like to give is the kettle drum, which is known as the naqara. And this came from the Arab world into Europe in about the 13th century. I mean, just by mentioning these few instruments, it's evident that medieval music was, medieval Arab music was very influential and it became the basis for the evolution of music, not just in the Islamic world, but also in Europe. But then the question arises, how did Arabian music and instruments reach the European lands? Well, in my humble opinion, I think it's pretty obvious. So there was a lot of trade between Europe and the Middle East in the medieval times. Also pilgrims go into the Holy Land and scholars that would visit probably brought these different instruments into Europe. There's also evidence at the time of Ibn Rushd, singers and musicians uh, would visit Christian towns and villages. So it's like nowadays, isn't it? When singers go on global tours um, and you know they go to sing internationally it was similar in the medieval times now don't go just yet because we have something for you to listen to before we end the video today we have a very special guest with us Heya, thank you very much for coming along thank you it's a pleasure to have you on here today thank you is a really good friend of mine and she sings very very well in arabic and seeing that today's video was about medieval music in the Arab and Islamic world, so I thought, why not bring her along so she can give us an example of what a medieval Arab song and poem would have sounded like. So the poem she will be singing, yes, it was actually written as originally as a poem in Farsi by someone called Hafiz who lived in the 1300s. And there isn't much information about Hafiz. Some say he was a Sufi mystic. Others say he was a Islamic scholar, but the fact is that he wrote this poem originally in Farsi. I know it's not exactly Arabic, but it did emerge from the medieval Islamic world, which is good enough for us. And this poem has been translated into Arabic and there are modern variations of this. And the name of the poem is called Ayyu Hassaki, which translates to the cup bearer. So someone who brings uh, the cups or the drinks in the medieval inn. So we're going to listen to Haya singing this. And you'll have a break from me talking about medieval history. Heya, whenever you're ready, stage is yours. Thank you. Ayyuh al-Saqi ilayk al-Mushtaka Qad da'awnaka wa in lam tasma'i Wa nadeem ilhimtu fi gurratihi Wa sharibtu al-raha min rahatihi Kullama istaykada min sakratihi Jadaba sikka ilayhi wa taka Wa saqani arba'an fi arba'i Ayyuh al-Saqi ilayk al-Mushtaka Qad da'awnaka wa in lam tasma'i 
من عيني عشيت من نظري أنكرت بعدك ضوء القمر أنكر شكواي مما أجد مثل حالي حقه أن تشتكى كمدى اليؤس وذل الطمع أيها الساقي إليك المشتكى قد دعوناك وإن لم تسمعي وندين همت في غرته وشربت الراح من راحته كلما استيقظ من سكرته جذب الصدق إليه واتكى وسقاني أربعا في أربعي Wow, that was amazing. Thank seriously, you. <laughs> that was, listen, I didn't know you could sing this well. Like today was another level. Seriously, thank you so much. That was so so good. You smashed it, and I really felt like I was living in the medieval times, sitting in the inn, waiting for my cup, with that music playing in the background. <laughs> and before before I end the video, I want to ask you a few questions about learning the song. Mm. So you sing contempt. So you sing contemporary Arabic music. What would you say the difference is between learning something that was made or written in the medieval times and learning something that was made nowadays? Um, I think it's the spirit or the the sound behind the song is very different. Yeah. So wait. I know the quietest part. I mean, it's a park, isn't it? You can't really get a quiet place, can you? And the weather is getting better, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waving at them, I don't know why. Safi? No, <laughs> She was waving. I just felt like I was famous as well. <laughs> I think that um, music back in the days, which um, this is quite different, you know, it's the music, the, you know, the sound of it, and. The, the language itself is much more, you know, has more meaning to it, like the words and stuff. So that's uh, that's why I think it just makes it more interesting to learn it. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And it's like, the, like you said, the, the the song has more meaning and more. It's, it's deeper, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And like, you know what? You said something about the language being different. Like, I'm Arab. I, I speak Arabic pretty much every day. Mm. I've been speaking Arabic since I can remember. And some of the the words, the lyrics, I heard like words I've never heard in my life. Exactly. It's like listening to like a different language. Yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. yeah, so for me to learn it was a bit like different. You know, I had yeah. to actually learn it. It wasn't like an easy song just yeah, to learn. Yeah, it, it was harder for you, wasn't it? Because exactly. you're like, pronouncing words you've probably never heard of, even though you've spoken Arabic as well all your yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, so listen, you absolutely smashed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And usually this is a part of the video where I'll be like, go follow Haya's YouTube channel or social media page for her singing. But surprisingly, she doesn't have anything out there. So I'm going to make sure I need to keep encouraging her to open something up for her singing. And I'll be the first one to shout it out, don't worry. <laughs> All right. Once again, thank you very much for watching the video. If you did enjoy it, do make sure you give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Also, leave a comment. I really do enjoy reading your comments and your recommendations. And we will see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>